Great and glorious Heavenly Father, we come before you, the church, as the body of Christ, and we praise you and we thank you for all your goodness to us, primarily for the goodness of your, the gift of your Son, who took our place, took our punishment, made us righteous before you, forgave our sins, and ensured us of eternal life. This time of year, we especially celebrate the coming of Jesus. And Lord, we ask that today what we do here would bring you great glory, that we'd be focused on you and only you. But also, Lord, that your church would grow and the, the faithful would become more faithful. And those who don't know you, Lord, would find faith in Jesus. Please bless the preaching of this sermon and the gathering of this crowd, for we ask it in the name of the one true Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Nice to see you all here. It's good to be here. It's better than jail or the hospital. Well, so I expect to see you all here on December 17th, on Saturday at 3 p.m. We're having people from other churches are going to join us, and hopefully a lot of people from the community, and we're just going to sing Christmas carols and have, what are we eating afterwards? Dessert. So I guess a few people need to bring some desserts. We can keep you guys cooking, don't we? <laughs> and uh, it ought to be a lot of fun. And... Uh, you can see the rest of your announcements. A couple of things have been canceled because of the Christmas uh, season. And I appreciate whoever quickly decorated the tree this morning. It was just like that. So whoever it was, thank you. Now, as is our tradition, this month's sermons are all focused on the coming of Christ. So if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. We'll get to it. Christians often complain that there's a culture war on Christmas. There really is no war on Christmas. Christmas is alive and well in the minds of people who think they understand it. The only reason our world seems to have forgotten the true meaning of Christmas is because the church has not been proclaiming it and living it like we should. What do you expect unbelievers to think about the birth of Jesus when we ourselves get caught up in all the materialism and commercial stuff and Santa Claus, all the nonsense of the season? Now, the Christmas message truly is the greatest news that mankind has ever heard. It's not about some cute scene in a stable, an inspiring ancient tale, or a reason to get and give gifts. The birth of Jesus Christ is great news because of who he is and what he came to do for us. If you weren't in Sunday school, you don't get it. You see, the Christmas story is only the opening act in God's great plan of redemption. To fully appreciate this story, it must be understood along with the Easter story, as it's called, the closing act of Jesus' life on this earth. Augustus was emperor of Rome when Jesus was born and was known for claiming to be a savior. It was even printed on his coins. A savior who would bring peace to the world. And as we're going to see in a second, his decree for registration was for the purpose of tax collection. So being descended from King David meant that Joseph must go to his town of origin to be registered. This was customary at the time, probably because it was easier to ensure that everybody got counted and everybody paid their taxes. Joseph, having decided 
to go through with the marriage to Mary, brought her with him to Bethlehem, though he technically didn't have to. Joseph was dedicated to caring for her and the coming baby. The town of Bethlehem was crowded because of the travelers that had come for the census and to pay their taxes. And inns or motels in those days were not nice places. So it was better to stay in a stable, but probably it was a cave. There were a lot of caves in that region, and the shepherds used to, in inclement weather, keep their sheep in the caves. When I was in Israel, it was the month of June, and we went to a cave just outside of Bethlehem that could have been one of those caves, could have been it, and we sang Christmas carols in there. I thought it was a little cheesy, but whatever. <laughs> Nevertheless, it was God's plan that the Savior be born into humble and simple conditions. Let's read these 21 verses. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, or Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Now, previously, we discussed Luke chapter 1, where the young virgin, Mary, was told by an angel that she would conceive a baby from the Holy Spirit. He would be called the Son of God. Now we pick up the story toward the end of her pregnancy, her and Joseph are now together, but they have not consummated their marriage. Luke is telling the story of Jesus' birth and includes minute detail for the purpose of establishing the historical certainty of what he's talking about. He skillfully includes information that proves that Jesus was the one prophesied in the Old Testament, including that he was of the family of the ancient king, David, through adoption by Joseph. The author uses contrasting things to expose the difference between Jesus and his mission and the one the Jews expected as Messiah. The contemporary belief then was that Messiah would come as a conquering hero, not as a little baby born to a poor couple in a simple village, much less in a stable. There are other connections here to the wrapping of the baby Jesus in swaddling clothes as compared to the adult Jesus being wrapped after his crucifixion. Also, Jesus' poor beginnings set the tone for his life since he never owned property and in his adulthood had no permanent home to go to. 
One of the most important things is the idea of servanthood. The king of the universe came as a human baby with the full intention to live a simple but perfect life and then die a horrible death because that was the only way for God and man to make peace with one another. God did all this because he loves us. Amen. The Jews of uh, Jesus' day were longing for the Messiah who'd been promised in the Old Testament writings, what we call now the first part of the Bible. They had endured decades under the Roman rule. They had a long history of oppression and suffering. The prophesied Messiah or anointed one would free the Jewish nation from Roman control and restore the kingdom of David. In our day, people are looking for something or someone. Whether it be a political leader who will restore the nation or a military leader who would free us from oppression, we long for this world to be better. More often, this search for help is more personal. Each of us has our problems, troubles, and sufferings. We want someone or something to relieve us from the hardships of life. We play the lottery in hopes of being wealthy. We abuse drugs and alcohol trying to forget our problems. Materialism and wealth become gods of a sort as we seek to feel better about ourselves through the pursuit of status and prestige, health problems, Cause us to try any sort of healing method we hear about. Spiritually, every person is seeking meaning and purpose. There seems to be a big hole in our souls, something lacking that seems just beyond reach. Whether we realize it or not, human beings were created to be in relationship with Almighty God. He made us that way. But because of sin, which is disobedience and rebellion against our Creator, we delude ourselves into thinking that created things can satisfy our souls. This God-shaped hole within us can only be filled by God, our Father in Heaven who created us. The search for spiritual fulfillment sadly, often leads to participation in false religions, cults, New Age, pagan beliefs, even Satanism. Atheists deny the problem by proclaiming that God doesn't exist. But we Christians believe that any sort of spiritual belief or practice which is not biblical and God-honoring is at best heretical, at worst demonic. Fooling around with these false religions is extremely dangerous. But God in his infinite grace, mercy, and love decided to provide the one thing that could fill that God-shaped hole. His son, Jesus Christ. Today we will explore this wondrous gift of salvation that will restore us to right relationship with him what we were intended to have all along. I'm going to tell you three things about this. I like saying that instead of four things. Jesus' birth in Bethlehem fulfilled Old Testament prophecy that the Messiah would come from David's line. first five verses of this passage <clears throat> tell us about that. <clears throat> I'm going to explain to you why they were there in Bethlehem to be registered for taxation and a census. And you, you notice in verse 2 he mentions this odd fact that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the story. That some Roman procurator named Quirinius was governor of Syria during this time. Luke, if you study the entire book, you'll see that he provides much historical detail 
And what this does is help to establish the historicity of what he's writing. Okay, so we can prove from ancient records who this guy was and where he ruled. Okay, and then uh, his hometown, his own town, his ancestral town, you, know, you might think of it as where your earliest roots came from or what town you lived in before you moved up here. His records were maintained there, and he was part of King David's extended family, Joseph was. And they were, it says they had been, uh, were betrothed, which we learned last week was a form of engagement. But in this case, it refers to he, they went ahead and got married, but they haven't consummated the marriage yet because she's about to have the baby. So we see in this passage, the entire passage, God's hand is at work in sending Joseph and Mary to fulfill prophecy because in the Old Testament, it was prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And so this was God's hand at work. Uh, there are two genealogies if you want to look them up. Uh, one is in Luke chapter 3 and the other is in Matthew 1 where you can see Joseph's uh, descend or his ancestors. So there's four big prophecies that were fulfilled in this passage hundreds of years after the prophecies were made. First, in Isaiah 7, it tells us that Jesus would be born to a virgin, and that's key to our faith. Micah, chapter 5, tells us that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Genesis 49 says that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah, which he did. And Jer uh, Jeremiah 23 and Isaiah 11 mention that the Messiah would be descended from King David. There's more. There's literally hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled by Jesus, his coming, his life, and his death. One day we should do a study on that. So this is amazing, that, and we've seen this so many times before, that in the Old Testament record, hundreds, in some cases even thousands of years before the events happened, they were predicted. And, of course, some people say, well, it was just designed that way by the writers. Sometimes, coming of Jesus, the, um, the prophecies are so precise. And the records have been maintained in such a way that we know the copyist who passed them down over the ages always made sure to keep them the same. They wouldn't change anything. Uh, you look at the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and we find out that just about the entire Old Testament uh, was the same 400 years before Christ as it is today. So the documents are reliable. But this should give us confidence as Christians that Jesus is who he said he was. And that what he did for us is actually salvation because of all these ancient records that confirm it. Now the fact that he was foretold in such detail should give us a wake-up call. This was no run-of-the-mill birth. He was prophesied to be the coming king of Israel, savior of mankind, and the ruler of the universe. Now he will rule, as we learned in the book of Revelation, when he returns. But he didn't come like we would expect. We would have expected him to come in on a white horse, <laughs> you know, with a, a, an army behind him. This was important that he come in to being in these humble origins. Very important. So the second point is the humble birth of Jesus, the Savior, pointed to his mission to give his life for sinners, verses 6 and 7. Time came for her to give birth. They had to find a safe place for that. Probably ended up in a cave, like I said, but a lot of times uh, they kept animals in the caves. So there would have been straw there for to lay the baby down. This is God who came in the form of a human baby in a stable. Stables are nasty, usually. They're kept real clean. This is the God of the universe. He didn't come in a castle. He didn't have a golden bed. 
He had animals all around him, no king's court. Sometimes God works in hidden places. Nobody knew about the birth of this baby, not yet. Until we get to the wise men on Christmas Day, we'll preach about that. We're going to see in just a minute about the, the shepherds. And they spread the word. He came to save lowly sinners. Sometimes when I think about that and my sin that's been forgiven, it blows my mind. That he could love me like he does. You know, a good, part, a good way to think about that is if God could love us this way, we should love others the same way. Just remember, his second coming won't be like this. First time he came, he came to save souls. Second time he comes, he comes in judgment. So when we think about this, the God of creation lowered himself 2,000 years ago to be a humble yet perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Any who would believe. He was the ideal servant figure, thus the reason for being born into a poor family. In a stable, laid in an animal's manger and rejected at the end, this humble, simple beginning for Jesus was not announced to anybody in power the religious leaders or anyone else, but first to some of the people in the lowest class of society, shepherds. So the third point is that humble shepherds who had heard the angelic announcement sought out the Savior and then told others about him. That angel brought good news to them. That's the word evangelize. Good news, the gospel. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. You need to look at that for a second. Verse 11. A Savior is announced. A Savior for mankind's sins. Christ is the Messiah that the Jews have been waiting for. The third title, the Lord, means he's God. The, shepherd, the, the angels announced this to the shepherds that your Savior, your Messiah, and your God has been born in a stable, the greatest thing that could ever happen. And then there was a multitude of heavenly hosts. Normally when we see the phrase heavenly host, that refers to the army of heaven, the army of angels. We don't know if this was an army or if it's just a generic word for a whole bunch of angels, but it would make sense to me that God's army would come and announce this because they're the ones that would be protecting everyone involved. That's speculation, by the way. Then one of the other things they say is peace among those with whom he is pleased. That's the correct translation. Many of the older translations, it says something pretty different. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. And then it says, after the shepherds go, they see Mary, they see Joseph, they see the baby, and I imagine they're discussing this, they're talking about it, and then it just says about Mary, she treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. She was only a 13, 14-year-old girl. Think about the things that have been happening to her. The angels already told her she's going to have a baby without having a man. Now she's had the baby, and she's hearing all this, he's Lord, he's God, he's Messiah. Later on, when they take him to the temple, someone's going to tell her, you're going to have heartbreak from this. She didn't know at that time what it would consist of. Can't imagine what's going through her head. Shepherds were among the lowest of social classes, yet God chose to announce the Savior's birth to them first. Again, the king of the universe chooses to come into the world as a humble child, not a conquering hero, which he could have done. And the simple people are the first ones to hear about it. This all points to the servant nature of Jesus' coming. He came as a servant to serve us. And the shepherds responded in three ways. They hurried to see this 
child king that they'd been told about, so they responded to the word of God. The words from the angels to the shepherds were the words of God, and they responded to it. They didn't ignore it. They didn't push it aside. They responded, and then they told everyone the good news. They were the first evangelists. What they had seen, think about it, the whole sky opens up, and there's a countless number of angels in all God's glory. And they announce the coming of the Savior. I tell people about, well, you know, sometimes you might hesitate to tell people you saw something like that. But when the glory of God is revealed like that, I can't imagine what they must have gone through in their spirit. They ran to see the baby. Then they told everybody about it. And they gave God the glory for what had happened. They recognized grace in action. They understood grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You can't earn it. God, in his own wisdom and will, decides to give us grace. So, that's your application right there. Respond to God's call to come and meet his son, if you haven't already. He is the Savior. He is the Jewish Messiah. And he is God. If that's true, you must respond. And then you need to let other people know about the good news. Are we doing that, church? With our friends, our neighbors, coworkers, family, are we telling them about this Savior King that came in such humble beginnings? And do we give glory to God for what he has done in our lives? We think about this when we're worshiping him. We'll be worshiping in spirit and truth. His grace. If I was God, I would have nuked me a long time ago. Now this is an incredible story. We know that. But it's a true story. And I hope you look at it in, with fresh eyes. Because it's very familiar to most of us, isn't it? Christmas story. This is more than an image for a Christmas card. Just think about it. God himself came in human flesh in very simple surroundings for one reason. He loves us so much that he sent his only son that if we believe in him, we should not perish but have everlasting life. If you're a Christian here today, it's my prayer that you've gotten a greater understanding of Christ's coming and what it means to your salvation. We also need to remember, be reminded that the first time he came, he came as a little baby. And the second time he comes, it'll be different. He lived a life that was perfect, personified servanthood. And he finally died on a cross. For you and me. You see, something happened that is supernatural on the cross there. And I can't fully explain it. But when Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, who was fully God and fully human, hung on that cross and died, right before he died, God placed on him the punishment for all the sins of the world. Here's mine. He was punished instead of me being punished and you. And once we come and we believe that, we don't have to know anything else. That comes later. Once we believe that Jesus died on a cross for me, he was punished. My sin is gone. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from our wicked ways. That's all it takes. Then the journey begins. Then the journey begins. You see, we're all sinners. Nobody has ever been able to get themselves to a point where they're in right relationship with God because of our sin. He's holy, perfect in all his ways, and he cannot be in the, the presence of sin, and he cannot condone sin. If he did, if he let someone slide, 
he wouldn't be perfectly just. And so we can't do anything about it other than respond. Just like these guys did, the shepherds. They responded to God's word. And what you're hearing right now is God's word being presented through me. It ain't my word. Respond, tell others about it, and give glory to God. And one other thing, if you don't already do this, I do it every Christmas Eve. I read this Christmas story to my family, and we talk about it a little, just to remind us that, yeah, we've got gifts under that tree. You know, we do a traditional Christmas thing, but it's all about Jesus and what he's done for you. May the Lord bless you. And keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I'm done early. We have a song, though.